I don't log into Facebook often, but the last time I did, I was super impressed by its simple, intuitive, and fast new UI. In today's video, I'll show you how to reverse engineer some of its UI features, specifically the top navigation bar, its icon buttons, and this multi-level animated dropdown. We'll do it using HTML, CSS, and because I mentioned the word Facebook, I'm legally obligated to use React in this demo. In the following code tutorial, you'll learn how to create icon buttons with Flexbox, you'll learn how to use CSS transforms to create sliding animations, and fundamental concepts in React, like component composition, hooks, and how to create CSS animations based on the state of your React application. And I'll throw in a bunch of other cool tips along the way. If you're new here, like and subscribe, and let me know if you want to see more beginner-friendly UI tutorials like this in the comments. Before we get started, let's take a closer look at what we're building today. By the end of this video, you'll have several reusable React components that you can use for navigation and dropdowns. At the top, we have a navbar component, where the children are nav items represented as icon buttons. These buttons have children that you can toggle on or off by clicking them. When we click the caret, it renders our drop-down component. It contains multiple drop-down items, and the ones with a chevron can toggle to a secondary drop-down menu. Notice how the old menu slides out to the left, and the new one comes in from the right. And because the height of the two menus won't be the same, we'll animate that as well. Now before we get started, I'd just like to say this is a beginner-friendly video, but we move at a very fast pace on this channel. So feel free to pause the video or slow down the playback speed as you follow along. The first thing we'll need is a React app. Assuming you have Node.js installed, open up the command line and run npx create react app, and of course the name of our app is Facebook. To keep this demo simple, I'm going to delete everything that's not the index.js, app.js, or index.css files. The index.js file is your initial entry point. I'll go ahead and remove the service worker stuff here, then you can ignore this file for the rest of the video. From there, I'm removing all the boilerplate code from the app.js file. We'll be using functional React components in this video. When you see a function whose name starts with a capital letter, you can think of that as a component. The return value of a functional component is your UI, or HTML, or more specifically, JSX. JSX is not actually HTML, but it's a syntax extension for JavaScript that allows you to write HTML-like templates in your components. But before we get too deep into React, let's open up the index.css file. The CSS in this video is pretty generic, so feel free to use it with your favorite framework. I'm starting by defining some global CSS variables that we can think of as our theme. And I'm also defining a speed variable that represents the animation speed, which will come into play later in the video. Then below that, I'm overriding the default unordered list style. And then for our link elements, I'll match them to the text color variable in our color scheme. That takes care of our initial setup, now we're ready to start building the top navigation bar. React, and especially functional components, make it really easy to break your application down into a lot of small reusable pieces. And this is a practice that we call component composition. In our app.js file, we'll define a new component named navbar, and it returns JSX inside these parentheses. We'll go ahead and add an HTML nav element with an unordered list inside of it. We can apply a CSS class to these elements using class name. Notice how this is different than regular HTML, which is normally just class. And we'll apply a class for navbar and navbar nav to make these elements easy to style. Now, if we go up to the JSX for the app component, we can declare this navbar there. And notice how we declare it almost like a regular HTML element. Now, I'm going to open up the CSS here on the right side and we'll apply some styles to the navbar. The navbar is basically just a rectangle that sits at the top. We'll give it a fixed height based on our nav size variable, and then some coloring and padding. The unordered list that sits inside the nav is the container for the children, which we'll set up as a flexible row. We want it to take up 100% of the width and the height of the parent, and then we'll set the display property to flex, and we can have all the children start on the right-hand side instead of the default left side by saying justify content flex end. Now at this point, we have some actual UI that we can take a look at. Go ahead and run npm start from the command line to serve your app. It should open in the browser automatically, and you should see this horizontal gray bar up at the top. And now the question becomes, how do we add items or children inside the navbar? In React, components can pass data and UI elements to each other using props. Add props as an argument to your function, and then you can reference it in your template. Props has a built-in property named children, and it will project or reference any UI elements that you pass in inside of the actual tags of that component. For example, if we go up to our navbar and add a list item inside of its tags, it will be rendered in the location that we called props.children. So if we open up the browser, you should see the letter X here up in the top left corner. But this gives us a great opportunity to create a new component called a nav item. Our nav item component will also take props and we'll set up a list item as its main element and then we'll nest an A or link element inside of it. 
The A element represents the icon button, so we'll give it a CSS class accordingly. Now this time, instead of referencing props.children, we're going to pass our own custom prop called an icon. Instead of adding UI elements inside of the tags, we reference our icon prop as we would with a regular HTML attribute. So props allow you to pass data from the parent to the child, similar to how you might pass an argument to a JavaScript function. Because remember, your React component is just a JavaScript function. For now, I'm just going to pass some emoji icons so we can focus on the CSS. Each nav item is a box that is slightly smaller than the navbar itself. An easy way to manage its width is to calculate it dynamically. So we'll take our nav size variable, which is 60 pixels, and then we'll multiply it by 0.08 or 80% with the calc function. Now each of these nav items should display their children directly in the center. We can easily do that with Flexbox by aligning items to the center and justifying the content to the center. So that gives us a box with its children in the middle. But now we want an icon button with a circular shape. I'm going to scope a new CSS variable to this class called button size. It also uses the calc function to give us a size that is exactly 50% of the original navbar size. And now we can apply that value to the width and the height of this class. And then to make the shape circular, we can apply a border radius of 50%, which creates a perfect circle. Now inside of this circle, we also want to center the children directly in the middle. So again, we'll set up a flex container and align and justify everything to the center. If you open your app in the browser, you should now see these three icon buttons here at the top. As an added touch, we might want to change the color slightly when these items are hovered over. An easy way to handle that is with a CSS transition. We'll apply it to the filter property and set it to a duration of 300 milliseconds. Then we'll target the hover pseudo selector on the icon button and we'll filter its brightness to 1.2 to make it slightly brighter as we hover over it. However, in the full demo and on Facebook, you'll notice that it's using SVG icons. You can find all the SVGs I used in the source code on GitHub. They live in this icons directory, but how do we use these SVG icons in React? It's actually very easy to use an SVG icon as a React component directly in your code. Add an import statement to the top of the file that references the path to your SVG icon. You import a React component and then name it whatever you want using the as keyword. And then you can do the same thing for all of the other SVGs that you want to use in your code. From there, we can go back down to our navbar and instead of using an emoji, we'll use braces to pass in one of our SVG components directly. And now your icon buttons can handle both SVG graphics and emoji strings equally. But your SVGs don't inherit a size by default, so we'll want to go ahead and set a fixed width and height for them. And now if we preview things in the browser, we should have an icon nav that is very similar to the actual Facebook UI. And now we're ready for the fun part, building an animated multi-level drop-down menu. Now the reason we're not passing the icon as a direct child of a nav item is because some of our nav items might have a drop-down menu, and we want that to serve as the children. We'll add a fourth nav item here with a caret icon, and our drop-down will go inside of it. Now in order to open and close a drop-down, our nav item will need to have some state, or in other words, some data that changes throughout the lifecycle of the app. We can manage state in React using a hook called useState. In our nav item component, we call the useState function, and it returns us with two values. The values are returned in an array, so we can destructure them as variables here using brackets. The first value is the state, which in our case is called opened, and is a Boolean value that tells us whether or not the drop-down menu is open. The second value is a function that you can use to change the state. We can also set a default value as the argument to use state, and of course we want the dropdown to be closed by default. That sets up the initial state, but now we want the user to be able to change the state when they click on the nav item button. We can do that by going down to our link element and we'll add an onClick event handler. When the user clicks a button, it will use the setOpen function that we got from useState, and it will flip the open value to the opposite of whatever it currently is. Putting a bang in front of a boolean gives you its opposite value. And that can be useful for toggling things on and off. Okay, so now the user has a way to toggle the state, but now we need to do something useful with the state. In our case, we want to show the dropdown when the open state is set to true. Below the link, we'll add braces, and if the open property is true, then we'll show the props.children. If the open state is false, then nothing will be shown here. We can test things out by going to our nav item component, adding a hello world, and you should see that appear when you click on the button. Obviously it looks terrible, so let's make a dropdown component to fix that. We'll add another function for a dropdown menu, and we'll have it return a div with a class of dropdown. Then we'll add our dropdown menu as the child of the nav item. Now similar to our navbar, a dropdown has multiple dropdown items. But in this example, I'm going to nest that component directly in the dropdown menu. The dropdown item will simply be a link with a class name of menu item, and then we'll pass in props.children to control the text of that link. Now you may have noticed in the demo that some of these links have an icon on the left and some have an icon on the right. 
We can handle that logic in a flexible way by adding slots for a left icon and a right icon. When you pass in a left icon or right icon prop, it'll be rendered, but if you leave it blank, then it just won't render anything at all. We can see it in use down here in the dropdown. A basic dropdown item will just take some text as a child, but if you want to show an icon on the left or right, you can also pass in the icon prop and pass it a component or emoji string. Now in order to get things looking right, let's go back to our CSS. The drop-down menu on Facebook overlaps just slightly with the top navbar, and we can achieve that effect by using absolute positioning. It allows us to explicitly offset an element based on its container. From the top of the parent navbar, we'll move the drop-down down by 58 pixels. That means it'll overlap by 2 pixels with the top navbar, which has a height of 60. We can give it a fixed width of 300 pixels, and then we'll move it over to the left by translating it over the x-axis by 45%. We'll give it some colors and padding, and we'll want to make sure the overflow property is set to hidden. What this will do is hide any child elements if they overlap this container. That's important because in a minute here, we'll be sliding in multiple menus through this container. Now the dropdown has multiple menu items. We'll set these up as flex containers that align their items to the center. In the context of a row, that means vertical alignment. Now when a user hovers over a menu item, we want to animate the background color. So we'll go ahead and set up a transition for the background. Then we can target the menu item's hover pseudo selector and change the background color to something a little bit lighter. As a final touch, we want the right icon in the row to be pushed all the way to the right side. With Flexbox, you can set the left margin of the last item to auto, and that will push it all the way to the right and everything else to the left. And now our drop-down menu is starting to take shape. At this point, we have a fully functional single-level drop-down, but we require an animated multi-level drop-down. To help us along the way, we'll install a very popular package called React Transition Group. It will help us control the conditional logic for rendering multiple menus and transitioning between them when they're added or removed from the application. Once installed, go ahead and import the CSS transition component from the package. Then we need to give our drop-down menu some state to specify which menu is currently visible. We'll set the main menu as the default, and then we'll also show a settings and animals menu as well. Now our active menu is the state or the name of the menu, and set active menu is how we change it. Now that we have state, we can animate elements in or out using CSS transition. We can go ahead and wrap our current dropdown elements in the CSS transition component. It's looking for a prop of in, which when truthy, will render and animate its children into the UI. In other words, when the active menu equals main, then we want to show the children inside of this component. I'm also adding a second property called unmount on exit, which completely removes these children when they're not active. Next, we'll set a timeout, which defines the duration of the animation. And the last prop we need to add here is class names, which we'll set to menu primary for this primary main menu. Now here's how the CSS transition actually works. It looks for the first child element, which we'll set up here as a div. Then when its in prop changes, it will add or remove CSS classes to this element based on the state of the animation. And it uses the class names prop to prefix those classes. CSS transition doesn't actually animate anything directly. Instead, it adds and removes classes based on the state of the animation, so you can handle the animations in your CSS. Notice how I'm setting up four different classes here. Menu primary enter, enter active, exit, and exit active. When the in prop first becomes true, it will add the menu primary enter class to the div. After a timeout of 500 milliseconds, it then adds the menu primary enter active class. Now when the in prop becomes false, it does the exact opposite. It adds the exit class, then the exit active class. This means you can easily create an animation using CSS transitions. We want our main menu to slide in from left to right. So initially, we'll translate it to the left by 110%, so it'll be completely invisible off to the left. After 500 milliseconds, we'll bring the translate back to zero, so it'll be in its normal position. Then we can animate it using the transition property, using our speed variable, and a timing function of ease. As you can see here, CSS is doing the animation while React is toggling the classes for you. Now to animate out, we'll do basically the same thing just in the opposite direction. We'll translate from zero to a negative 110%. Now at this point, everything should be exactly the same. That's because we need a secondary menu to toggle to. Let's get started with that second menu by copying our CSS transition and pasting it directly under the existing one. Instead of checking the active menu for main, we'll check the active menu for settings. For class names, we'll use menu secondary because we want to set up different classes for this menu to slide from right to left. Now the classes work in exactly the same way. The only difference is that we're translating to positive 110% versus negative 110%. The effect is that the secondary menu will be offset to the right and then it will slide in to the left. And that's all it takes to build the basic slide in slide out animation. 
but we are missing one piece of the puzzle, and that's a way for the user to activate or deactivate a menu. We have our set active menu function from useState, so we'll go ahead and bind that to the click event on the drop down item button. But instead of hard coding a value here, we're going to look for a prop that's passed down from the parent component. And we'll want to make sure that prop exists before we call the set active menu function. Now, to get our demo working, we can go down to any drop down item and set the go to menu prop to whatever menu we want to navigate to, which in our case will either be settings or main. And now, if you open up your demo, you should have a functional multi level drop down. But we're not done quite yet. There's still some additional polish that we have to take care of. Go back to your demo and add a bunch of drop down items to one of the menus. Notice how the height is not animated, it just snaps into place and totally ruins the entire animation. This happens because the old menu hasn't been completely removed from the DOM by the time the new menu is visible. What we need is a more dynamic way to manage the height. Let's create some state for the height of the menu. Then we'll create a function called calculate height. And this function takes a DOM element as its argument. That's because a DOM element has a property called offset height, which contains the actual height in pixels of that element. And now you might be wondering, where do we get this element and when do we call this function? Well, the CSS transition has lifecycle hooks that we can tap into. One of these hooks is onEnter. It calls a callback as soon as the enter class is first added to the element, and it also provides the element as an argument, which means we can simply pass in our calc height function here as the prop value. That will recalculate the height of the menu, now we just need to apply it as a style to the dropdown itself. We can go up to the style attribute and dynamically pass in the height from our state, and that leaves us with one final step to animate it. Go to the dropdown class in your CSS and add a transition for the height. Now when you go back to the demo, your dropdown should magically shrink and grow based on the size of the current menu. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe, and let me know what you want to see next in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.